Today, we talk street photography and persistence on Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome again to Behind the Shot. I'm your host, as always, Steve Brazel, and I'm going to start with a disclaimer. I woke up with no voice this morning. It's entirely possible I will lose it throughout the show. Trust me, it's well worth doing. If I have a coughing attack, I'll try and edit it out as best I can to save your ears. So first of all, thanks for joining me for Behind the Shot. This is the podcast where we try and get inside the minds of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion and all the challenges and stories that happen in between. And today I got a great guest for you. I do wanna mention a couple of things before we get into the show. I am doing now quarterly a contest with Red River Paper. If you do print your own pictures, you've never tried Red River Paper, I can't recommend it enough. I've got a stack of it over here that I've been playing with and it's really, really nice paper. You definitely need to try it out. Here's basically the concept of the the uh, the contest and you can find out all the details and the info at behindtheshot.tv in the menu at the top, click contests and click Red River Paper and it'll tell you how you enter and everything. But just to give you a summary, on any of the normal main social media, Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, follow Behind the Shot, follow Red River Paper, and then post one of your photos that you like, mentioning that you'd like a sample pack of Red River Paper. Make sure that you tag properly so that we see it behind the shot and Red River Paper, and use the hashtag that is in the instructions. It changes each contest. So head on up there. I think the one probably when this show is going to air is RRP Sample Pack, meaning Red River Paper Sample Pack. So just RRP Sample Pack. Make sure that you get that in there as well. And then what we're doing is we're giving away 10 Red River Paper Sample Packs. And one of those 10 is going to win a custom 13 by 19 print of the image that we discuss on a show with an education, a photography education student. And the student this time around is a fantastic young lady from uh, the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. So again, head to the website, behindtheshot.tv, check out the contest rules, you can find everything there. So let's get into my guest. I'm gonna say a few things before I bring him in because We've been trying to get together to do this show for some time. I was on his show and just fell in love with his work. Street photography to me is such an unusual, difficult thing based on the type of photography that I do. And Marco is is so good at it. I've been trying to get him on for a while. And finally, we get together. I'd like to welcome to the show Marco LaRousse. Marco, how are you, my friend? Thank you so much, Steve, and sorry it took so long, but you know, this is actually my very first time that I'm on video, doing a video interview, which is recorded. Usually I only do audio podcasts, but this is the first time, so I had to buy a camera, got this little earbud, so already, and uh, since this is the first time for me, if you lose your voice, just blame everything that goes wrong in this show. On me, I will, okay? okay, good, I have an out. <laughs> You're gonna be my savior. Uh, yes. Interesting, because if this is your first video podcast, you did it right. For those, I have an audio feed only as well. It's a little more difficult because we're discussing a photo. It's easier if you see it. But if you are listening on the audio, Marco has a whole studio set up with his podcast network logo behind him. So you took the time to set it up right. It looks really, really nice. Let's um, let's talk about you a little bit before we get into your image. You're a fine art street and documentary photographer and you're award winning at doing that. I'm kind of curious of all the areas of photography, what led you into that more documentary type style? I think it's my curiosity of people. I was very lucky that my parents took me traveling at a very young age. I was able to see many countries that other people in my age at the time, I mean, I'm born in the 70s, early 70s, so I've been around some time and I was able to fly many places in the world at a time when it wasn't so usual to fly around. So my contact with different cultures and my curiosity has always been there. And the street photography and documentary part really became very prominent in the 90s. I studied in the US and I you know, met a lot of people from around the world and I, they offered me to visit them in their, in their home countries. And so I got to fly to Japan and Taiwan, Korea, wow. all these places in, in, in Hong Kong, China, in Asia. And whenever you are there, you know, you go to a place, you don't speak the language. In, in Japan in the early 90s, you couldn't read the signs. They hardly had any Western signs there. So you're totally lost. And for me, of course, I had some 
insider people there, but they went along their daily work. So during the days, usually I was on my own and I just took my camera and I, I walked outside and I captured what I found interesting because I was the first person from my family who traveled to Asia. We always traveled you know, in Europe and, and North America and the Caribbean and stuff like that. But that was the first time in Asia and I saw so many things. It was like an explosion from my eyes. I was just walking See, and walking and walking. And as a kid, now a lot of military families get that where they travel abroad. Um, but as a kid, that's one of those, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That's, that's one of those life education moments that can change a child's outlook for the rest of their life. I should mention, by the way, you live in Germany, Hamburg, Germany, uh, yes. which makes sense when people see come up on screen your your uh, Twitter handle. But I want to mention the logo behind you because PPN, Photo Podcast Network, uh, you founded that with Scott Bourne and you do four shows a month, but it's an interesting concept and I actually really like the concept. You don't do, it's it's not repetitive where it's the same concept of a show each week, right? Each of the week, week one of any month is show A and week two is almost a different kind of a show. So what are the four shows that you do? So one is a uh, question and answer, of course, um, our listeners sending in photography related questions. The other show is camera inspiration. That's the show that you were on where exactly. we really talk a lot about the why before the how in photography. It's very inspirational. It's it's really stuff that we talk about today. You know, what's behind a shot? Why are you doing what you're doing? What was your education? You know, I had, I had some great people on there like you. I have uh, also the Tankman photo I talked about with uh, Jeff Whitener. So famous people also come to the show. It's it's really great. A lot of people enjoy this show. We also have an inspirational photo book of the month there and a the photographer. So it's educational and inspirational there. Then, of course, we have the photography and gear show where we talk about certain gear or, you know, it can be about strobes. It can be about cameras. It can be about filters. It can be about different lenses and what to use them for. It's always the concept, not just to talk about gear, but what is what right. can you do with it, what's useful or what's, what's really the purpose behind that. You know, always purpose-driven. Only buy this if you need that. Other, you know, otherwise, don't buy it. And, um, of course, then we have the We Should Mirrorless show because uh, I've been a mirrorless photographer for a long time, but on the digital end, let's say seriously, for eight years, when the first uh, Fuji X100 came out, there was a day that I dumped my DSLR. Beforehand, I had to shoot DSLR. You know, at the time, the DSLRs were the best sensors, cameras at the time. And a long time ago, you know, as you, you see some of the cameras up there, for those of you listening, I have uh, Rolei Flex and two old Leicas, film Leicas there uh, on my board next to some other cameras that I have in my closet because those are quiet cameras. And when you want to do documentary and street photography, it's nice to have a quiet, unobtrusive camera. So we, we talk about mirrorless cameras and, you know, news and stuff like that. So that's, that's my point behind PPN was when we founded that to have a monthly camera camera magazine for audio only. So if you care about photography and you have an, have an hour to an hour to spare, you know, each week, we cover a lot of stuff and we don't always cover the same thing. And I think it should make it interesting. You know, I, I, I started this with the concept, what do I want to listen to? What do I think is missing? Because there are shows that are doing the same thing. They talk about news, they have a listener question stuff. That's great. But I just thought maybe, you know, just do different shows. And so far it worked out well. Yeah, and and again, it was an honor to be on the show. Um, it was last year sometime, as I recall. You do workshops in the Hamburg area, one-on-one -on -one group workshops. Um, there's something I saw in you as I was researching you. You're a founding member of the German Street Photography site. So you are, you're invested in photography and street photography specifically, which is what we're gonna talk about today. I've only had one other street photographer on, and that was Valerie. You, I'm sure, know Valerie Jardin. My friends, uh, yes. And that was, I, I got so much amazing feedback on that, because there's a lot of, I'll say, street photographers and aspiring street photographers. And a lot of people who wanna do it are confused by, oddly, not some of the technical stuff. A lot of them understand photography. In, in my conversations with people that want to do street photography, what they they tend to be a little bit more confused on is the process or idea of street photography. So, so answer this for me before we get into the image. At its core to you, what is street photography? I mean, let's start there. What's street photography? 
Uh, you know, the great thing about this genre, or maybe the most difficult thing about this genre is that there's no clear definition. It's a fairly broad genre of photography that usually takes place in public, so public spaces. This is not about in private houses or offices. You know, we have semi-public spaces like shopping malls, but usually it's a place where anyone can go. That's where you take the image. Usually it's capturing people in the image, but it doesn't have to be. You can also take street photos of animals, you know, of dogs, for example. There, there are a lot of those out there as well. Or you can just take photos of urban objects that are left by mankind. But somehow there must be some kind of human interaction in the image. So either something built by humans, something left by humans, or animals that are interacting in the urban space or something like that. So that to me is street photography at the broadest core. And there, the street photography I do is usually not staged. People stage it, they're street portraits. So it, it's really broad in, in my opinion. Okay, that, that brings in a question to me then. How does street photography differ from photojournalism as it were? So, so what makes a good street as opposed to photojournalism? What makes a good street photography image? Well, photojournalism, I think you go out with a purpose. You go out with a purpose because you want to document something that's going on or that is changing. In street photography, you really go out most of the time, I do, without a plan. You know, you, you step out the door and that's, you said it's one of the most difficult genres of photography because you just step out the door and whether you get the shot or not, is already decided by the time you turn either right or left when you step out of the door. So you have to be there in the right time, at the right time, in the right place, and you don't really plan it. There are people who plan their shots. They go back to the same place over and over. I'm not like that. I'm, I'm really, I'm floating there and a great street photo for me and that is my definition, and that is my goal for street photography, is I capture an image that can stand on its own. It doesn't have to be a series, but it should tell a story. Right. Okay. So I'm capturing a moment, and no matter what story I saw, of course, there's a reason. We'll be talking about this on this image today, but there's always a reason why I take an image, but I'm so curious, and I love it when people tell me what they see in the image. And it's hard to really get people to take time. I think it's wonderful you have this show because we're taking time to look at one image. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's the thing. You you just mentioned something though that struck a, a note in me. You made the comment, I love it when people tell me what they see in an image. And isn't it fascinating? It is to me, at least with my work, how often people see something in an image that I never saw. And it's my image. And people, yep. oh, I see X, Y, Z. And it's like, really? Yep. That to me is the beauty of, of art in general. Yes. So yes, let's so. get into this shot here. Now, as I bring this shot up, I'm, I'm going to ask you a couple of just technical questions first, because I like to get those out of the way, because there's always people who want to know the, the technical side of things. Okay. This <laughs> image, do, does it have a name? No. Okay. So image X, Y, Z. Where was this shot? This was shot in Paris. Uh, I think it's a subway station. Um, it's called Saint Lazare or something. Sorry, Valerie. So a metro just, station in Paris. It's a metro station in Paris. And yes. what what body lens combination did you photograph this with? You know, I should have prepared for this. I'm sorry. That's okay. If you don't know, that's <laughs> fine. It was either a Fuji X Pro One and a 35 F14 or a Fuji X100 S at the time with a 35 equivalent, so a 23. So it was either shot at a 35 or 50 millimeter equivalent. Okay, and, and you like the Fujis for this type of image, why? I like them because, as you Valerie's can tell, I'm the same way. Fashion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, street photographers, we probably like it because the X100, which came out eight years ago, is a leaf shutter. It's quiet. It's small. It has a lot of button and dials externally on the camera that function like the old camera. So when I look down at my camera, I don't even have to look through it or at the display. I have my shutter time. I have my eyes owned. I have my aperture. That's the basic you right. need for photography. And with that, I can take the shot and you know maybe focus manually or, or use autofocus. But that is what I need. And I find it very convenient to have it all there. There are no bad cameras out there today anymore. I could no. shoot it with the other camera. Of course, a DSLR is not that good. It's it's fairly big and it's noisy with the with the mirror slap. 
but any kind of mirrorless camera would do the job. But, you know, Fujis have worked for me and I like the, the black and white that I can set internally in the camera, but Panasonic would work or any okay. other camera as well. All right. So you just said, and you like the black and white. And that that's one of my questions. Not always. Let's get that out front before somebody emails me and says you're wrong. Not always, but so often street photography is black and white. And I've gotten answers from various other people as to why they think, to you at least, why, why is street photography so often black and white? And specifically to this image, what does it gain by being in black and white versus color? So as, as the new street photographers going out there and they're trying to decide, should it be black and white or should it be color? What are those decision choices that people like you make to get this amazing feeling out of a shot? Well, I can only speak for myself, of course. I think actually nowadays, many people tend to do street photography in color. It's getting more popular. Uh, I think it's just because the classic street photography has started in black and white. At the time, people were shooting with Leicas in the 50s or in the 40s or even 30s on the street. That was black and white film at the time. And of course, they were using those small Leica 35 millimeter cameras or exactly. equivalent. So of course, it started with that. And it was really only in the late 60s that color became a thing. But at the time, the art world and street photography is art. Uh, the art world didn't really look at color photography as something that belongs in a gallery. And I think that's just how it happened with black and white traditionally. Now, today we have the choice. I mean, I'm also capturing my images in black and white. Exactly. Okay. And, when, and, and you've raw. got a chance to decide and post. Right. And I do have a raw image on the side. But, you know, whenever I compare the two next to each other, most of the time the black and white is just more appealing. And you said, what do you gain for it from it? Well, maybe it's it's what I would lose with color because color can be quite distracting. Okay. And color, it's the same for me for portrait. I'm probably 95% currently and have been in the past a black and white photographer. I just like black and white portraits because it just takes some of the things out that we judge people by. What they wear, what color they wear, what color eyes they have, hair color. It reduces that to grayscale. And to me, black and white is just so much more true although it's fake we don't see in black and white but it's it, it really it makes you look beyond the skin color the eye color the scarf the shirt everything it reduces it down makes us all a little bit more equal and i have the feeling when i look at great at a great black and white portrait i look more at the structure of the face i look more at the wrinkles did this person maybe have a hard life or an easy life i it's almost to me like i get a little glimpse into the soul with black and white see and, and it's and very hard to to do that with color, in my opinion. I, I And I totally agree with you. And, and in concert photography, we go black and white sometimes because the lighting is just so poor. But the other reasons that I go black and white and the way I des describe it to people is the beauty of removing color from an image is you boil an image down to its raw shape. And it's those, those geometric or non-geometric shapes that can help lead an eye. Color can as well, but they can help lead an eye into an emotion, I think at times, uh, stronger than with so many stimulus of different colors. So it, when you're setting up for a shot like this, obviously there's people here and we're gonna see some behind the scenes stuff and some other shots from this, this location. But before we do that, when you're setting up for a street photography shot, there's people in this image. Do you care if they see you taking the picture? Uh, well, this is <laughs> actually we could do a whole show on this because this is about ethics and empathy in street photography. And that is something that I value very highly. Okay. Is to respect people's privacy. You'll see in a lot of my image that I publish, you can really not point out a person. You cannot really see the face or too much of the person because in my opinion, that's another thing we leave out color. But if you leave out the face and focus on the structure, on the motion, on the, on the, on the, maybe the shape of the hat or what people are doing in silhouettes. I think it even adds more to the mystery and makes you think more about what are these people doing in this story, right. in this image. So yeah. Um, privacy is something that, that I value very highly. A Bruce Gilden, of course, shooting with a flash in people's face is something that I would never do. Well, I'm just saying that never right now, 
I, I think I'll, <laughs> I'll be consistent with that. I just think it's it's a no go. Um, and so I do to, to do try- that though, you're in a public place here. So is the camera down by your hip? I mean, what are you doing so that people don't see you photographing? A and B. Then how do you compose these nice, wonderful, shadowy mystery shapes? Yeah. Well, that takes a lot of practice, <laughs> and I have been photographing for thirty plus years now, and I think street photography for more than twenty years. You just somehow get it's hard to tell that there's some kind of instinct that has grown in me that I know how to set the camera and I know how, how to capture it. Sometimes I like in this image, I'm pretty sure I composed this with a camera to my eye because I was far enough away and these people were not paying attention to me. Right. Plus I know how to dress. I know how to move. I know how to act like a tourist. So I'm like a chameleon. Okay. Most people, even, even if I go to a person afterwards and say, by the way, you know, I, I, I don't do this very often, but you know, I show the image and they say, really, you took my image. I thought you were taking an image of something else. See, so, okay. You just said something fascinating to me that I've never heard before. And I should mention for the people on the audio feed, I would describe this image to you. I can't, it's, it's, it's a, it's a black and white street photography image underground in a, in a tube station in a in a metro station with shadows on the wall it's so intricate i would do it a disservice to try and and do that if you are listening on the audio feed just go find the post on behind the shot.tv for this episode the image is at the top that'll make it easy for you to find and it's in the gallery at the bottom of of marco's work i'll have a gallery of images there so but you mentioned something and that is you know how to dress and i've never heard anybody mention that but there's an old saying act like you belong and you belong, right? Walk in somewhere acting like you belong and fewer people will ask you who you are and ask for your credentials. And I never thought about applying that concept to if you fit in as just one of them in this station, based on how you dress, present yourself, stand, walk, that that actually to me is a fantastic tip. Yeah, like you belong there. Sometimes also act like you don't belong there. Be a tourist. I've run through my own city with a backpack and a city map sticking out because, you know, a tourist, of course, is going to run around with a camera (laughs) and taking pictures of things. So there are many ways. And, you know, I I couldn't say, okay, what's your street dress? Of course, you know, I like muted colors. I wear gray, black, you know, no bright colors. But if I was to shoot on Hawaii in Waikiki, I'd probably wear a Hawaii shirt just to match and blend in. So really that's, that's bring really less part attention of to yourself no, really is, is what it is. I, I, this shot, there's, there's one thing when I first saw this shot, I wondered about though clearly, and we'll see it in the, in the before shots, the, the, the secondary shots I'm going to bring up later, but clearly there's this beautiful light shining with shadow on the wall coming from like a skylight type thing. When you are, however, composing this, are you looking at the interaction of, I'm going to call them the subject, although the whole scene is really the subject for here, but the, the people in the scene, except for the one lady holding something, they're all in a clean spot in the boxes. Um, the railing intersects the lines of the shadows in a way that accentuates and adds to it rather than distracts from it. Are you looking at these shadows and light, this natural light, and trying to assemble them? Or is it however they land, they land? No, no. Uh, like that, you will never get lucky <laughs> in street photography. It's really? all about okay. timing. I mean, Catherine Besson, Henri Catherine Besson talked about the decisive moment. And that is definitely what we are after. But the art form is really to see what's coming. It's really about the, the moment before the decisive moment that you're getting ready and you're saying, okay, I think this person and this person, they're going to be in that spot at that time. I'm timing the strides of the feet. I'm, I'm timing when people are on the lines of thirds. I don't think about that, but, but subconsciously I'm doing this because I've been doing this for so long. And, and this image, just to describe a little bit, is really the, the, the light orb in the background which comes from the skylight right. looks like a cat eye yes it does yeah and, yeah and all surrounding is like a big black vignette so this is the bright spot and 
in the in the pictures leading to that is really you'll see how how I came up with this idea while I was walking along there. So so it's really there's there's this cat eye. There's a structure in there from the skylight. Behind that, there are some net because there was a construction going on. So we have two layers already That's going what on those in, are. Okay. in the background. Now I'm telling you, see, I wish I should have asked you before and what you saw in that image. <laughs> anyway, so and then and then you see, then you have the, the front layer. So you have you have shadows in the background. You even have people in the background going downstairs and escalators. And in the foreground, you have silhouettes because you have a bright, uh, a very bright background. This that's called cat eye light orb, and the people walking past cast some beautiful silhouettes. So I was of course exposing for the background, making sure that I get a nice clean silhouette. Okay, so you literally just went through and answered like my next four questions, which is awesome. <laughs> I dig that because I was going to ask, and now I know you know that you're the fact that you're timing their gate. Actually, I like because there's a lot of people it's almost like watching this chess game play out that's that's got to actually be a, a huge part of the fun at least it would be to me but that answers the question of you're clearly cropping this cat eye in camera in your eye you see this you see this finished image and that's a big thing the, the I, I don't think photographers put enough weight on pre-visualization and i think it's a key to things seeing these shadow patterns seeing the people and the positions of the people to the shadows and to the geometric shapes like the rails and everything that's a perfect kind of segue into some of these these secondary shots. So the reason that at the beginning of this episode, I mentioned that it's street photography and persistence is because you said something to me as we were picking a shot that struck me and landscape photographers, really good landscape photographers do this a lot. They go and they get this beautiful shot, but they realize, man, if there were just some some nice cumulus clouds up there, this would be beautiful. And they'll go back to that and they'll go back to that. Or they'll take a bird takeoff and it's good, but they weren't, the sun wasn't in the right spot. And they'll do that for 10 years before they, Scott Bourne is one of them with his uh, cranes in the fire mist. They will go back year after year after year after year. Each shot is great, but perfection comes from that persistence. And you said something to me about this image that you knew there was an image in this location for years, for a long time, and that you you uh, it took you time to find the image that you wanted. So the first background image is the portrait orientation one, where you're looking at the entrance to the staircase going down and you've got the skylight and you can see the netting yep. in this image that's making part of those shadows. This in and of itself, I can see ways that you could make a really cool image with this skylight alone. Street photographers like yourself see what I don't, which <laughs> is I see this and I see shapes and I see netting and I try and figure out where do I put the netting standing where I'm at or moving a little so that that building isn't distracting, right? That's the way a non-street photographer thinks. Marco goes, Oh, I know, I'll use the shadows, okay? So hopefully I learned something from this. But this, this led you to thinking of going inside and using these structure, these, these elements? Right, so this was a very hot day in Paris. It was around noon. People on this square were eating baguettes. It's not a stereotype. They really do for lunch, <laughs> having a glass of wine. So it was hot outside. It was nice weather. I've been walking around for miles. Good shoes, by the way. It's a secret to street photography. Good street photography. Very good shoes. Yeah, you got to be comfortable so first. I probably already covered 10 miles by the time I was there. It was, it was noon. So you know how much I walk on these days. And I walk down and I'm standing and, and then I, I see this this bubble again, of course, this this skylight train station. I'm thinking, Man, this is so cool. There must be a shot there. So I, I put my fish eye lens, eight millimeter fish eye lens, which is a 12 millimeter equivalent on the Fuji X Pro One at the time that I had. And I'm standing there. And of course, these kind of structures just work with fish eye. So I'm standing there and I'm taking the shot in portrait orientation. I'm thinking, yeah, 
yeah, the structure is nice and everything is nice, but there's really no story in there. There's a guy with a white suit and hat on the side, but he's too far away. With a fish eye, you have to be really close and then people look funny, you know? So with a fish eye, it's almost a no-go, but here I thought this is a fish eye shot because everything is surrounded. This structure is there. So I said, okay, let's just go down the staircase and see maybe if I can do something the other way around. And that's really leading to the next shot. And that, that leads to this fish eye from inside looking back out. Again, you can see the netting. And I, I got to be honest with you, this in and of itself. Uh, the other one to me, I, I see your, your mind process working. This to me is a finished shot. This is phenomenal. I love this with the lady with the stroller and the skylight and, and the symmetry of it. I like this shot. But what I love about this is it, this to me leads to the next one is, you see the outside, you know there's a shot, you go in. Once you get in, you turn around, you shoot the skylight, and now you start to see the, the, the full realm of grayscale start to pop. You start to get those deep blacks. You start to get shadows. You start to get the bright light of the skylight, which then to me leads to the third shot. Which yeah, now you're down in the, the, the bowels of this station yeah. with, I, it, I, I don't even, is this eight millimeter? Yeah, it's still eight millimeter. Let's just go back very quickly to the, to the second shot okay. because these are all shots that didn't make it. And, and, and so this the reason is a why rejection I, to you. Yes. Yes. It's a re rejection. I um, would put that in my portfolio, dude. The, the series, what we're doing here is basically we picked this shot because I wanted to take you and the listeners and the viewers along inside my head, what's going on in my head when I try to get a shot. And this is a nice series because I took so many images on the way. And here I turned around and I thought, yeah, with a fish eye, you know, it's almost like a UFO. The skylight is really nice. Mm -hmm. The lady with the stroller, I should have really helped her. But seriously, when I look through the viewfinder, I don't see this. I only compose people like a, che like a, like a chessboard, like you said that. I don't really see what they're doing. I only try to time things right. There's a couple in the middle holding hands. And in the middle there, I don't know how you call this. this is like we call them grocery getter, grocery Mercedes, we call it here in German. This is, this is a little like a basket with wheels right. on there, so like a trolley for, for groceries. We have these here in Europe because you go to the markets, uh, to the farmer markets and stuff like that. So they're holding hand. It's, it looks like they're holding it up. It, it can't be. I don't know. The perspective is really strange. And then there are people on the left and on the right behind there, two people with the bags going up the escalator. So there's a lot of commonalities, but I think a lot of people will not see a story in there because it's just too much going on. So I think this was a good shot, but I realized this is not it. And I turned around and this is now leading to shot number three. Which, which simplifies everything to shape now, right? So you've gone from really busy outside with the building to a story, but a busy story and what subject is a viewer gonna pick? And that's questionable at that point. And now you're narrowing it down. And the reason I love this one, and I chose this one, you, you sent me a number of them, and this one had to be in here, is because you see the reflection now, the, the light, not a reflection, but the light shining on the wall. And that I can, I can already tell. You immediately start seeing that, and now you start seeing these shapes. Yeah, yeah, right. So this is a nice overview of when I turned around and this is going down the staircase into the station, a nice round big hall, almost like a tower uh, with the skylight on top. You see the escalator and the stairs going through it. And I was still at that point, I was thinking, this is fisheye territory. It's all round. There's a lot of structure in there. And I was too far away really from the reflection. But at that time, it's the first time I saw the reflection and I saw that actually you can see shadows in the reflection. Right. And I thought, huh. Maybe I need to move on because this shot is not good at all. It's just an overview shot of what I saw at, the, at, at that moment when I was standing there. But it's but it's a walkthrough. <clears throat> and then you start moving on, on shot number four of the behind the scenes. You start getting that. I mean, reflection is the only thing I think of. It's really not a reflection. It's the light shining on the wall. But you start getting more of that light and a little bit brighter on the landing that's below the light that people would walk on. Yeah. And you start to really see the station and you see the cool the cool shapes and everything in the station. But this is the the one shot where clearly that reflect that I keep saying reflection too. But you know, that light on the wall starts becoming its own subject. And in this one, you can see people in the light. Yes. 
first, you know, I was still focusing at the UFO first. It looks like a UFO, the nice right. uh, round lights and, and the staircase. It looks like the Enterprise, the old Enterprise, you know, a little bit. Yeah. So I was actually looking at that because I used to have a series called Spaceship Architecture. I knew we liked each other for a reason. You're a Star Trek guy. Okay, go. <laughs> And and then really when I thought, yeah, but nothing is happening, there's no people in there. And then I see on the bottom left, really this, the light orb, the cat eye. Of course, it's not exposed right here. But I thought, okay, see, now you can see four people walking there on the staircase. And I thought, okay, maybe the story is another place. So I, I figured I needed to go downstairs closer to that. And, and that leads us to <clears throat> the one where you're totally below it, looking up. And now you've got people walking in front of it. And this to me is really, the, this series of shots is really what the show's about. And that is getting inside your mind on how this shot came to be. Being a really good street photographer wasn't you walking in there and going, oh, shadows, click, done, miracle shot. No, it's mm -hmm. a thought process and it's seeing the light. Which brings us really to that hero chosen image. Having seen all those behind the scenes, I want the viewers to really look at the cat eye now and look at the fact that you not only have people on this landing from this angle, once he, once he decided to move and shape and get that thing on, it's, there's a number of rules here. You got rules of thirds, but you've also got a golden spiral happening in here. There's a lot of photography rules being met here subconsciously, but then it's not all 3D people shadows. There are still shadows on the wall of people. So this is almost landscape-like where you have foreground, mid-ground, background subjects, right? Um, yes. Just- Do you see the story though here? Yes. <laughs> No, no do, oh, tell me which story you see, because there, there's a definite story that I see in, in this image. Okay, and, uh, so I, I see a couple of stories. One, I see commute, right? To me, this is a commute because of the fact that I can clearly see people on different levels of a staircase. Not, not necessarily commute. This could be a business building too, but it's, but it's, it's, it's human pedestrian transportation. But then you start to see the couple in the front talking to each other. And that in and of itself is a story to me. What is she holding? I'm not sure. What are they talking about? She's obviously animated in the way that she's talking. Um, it, it's almost like from the cat eye view, it's, it's an insight or view onto people's daily lives. Yeah. Well, I, it looks to me like Maybe they're arguing or she's scolding the man. Because she's, she's clearly animated. That hand so is she's up. she's like, don't do this again. <laughs> Maybe, who knows? I mean, that's a, that's the whole point. We will never know. But this is a story that I saw in this image. So, do you so notice he's the couple looking. on the right? And they're not a couple. Yes. There's a guy no, in the foreground, but there's a shadow on the wall. And they almost look what like they're talking to each other. What is she doing? Same thing. It looks like. He's doing scolding him and walking in the other direction. So it looks like there's world. interaction going on between between those. And then the big cat eye in the background, like, maybe like the conscience looking down at them. So who knows? Tell me this. <laughs> on a shot like this, what would you have done in post? Uh, on this shot, actually, maybe I did a little bit of cropping because I couldn't get close enough due to the angle. I was below there. So maybe a if it was a 35 or 50 equivalent, maybe I wasn't close enough. I don't know. I think I cropped it just a little bit and I might have helped a little bit with the vignette because I think there was a little bit more light shining from the top right, right. which would have broken open up the vignette. So I think I darkened it there a little bit, but that was pretty much it. Maybe increase the contrast. End of story. That's it. That's it. That's it. Wow. I love seeing exactly. how it came about. I do. I do wonder doing what you do and you do the one-on-one -on -one workshops and you do the group workshops in Hamburg. But if a if a, a young aspiring street photographer came to you and said, what's the best advice you could give me on street photography in general? What's your one, I don't want to call it a tip, but your best piece of advice you would give a street photographer? Uh, there are so many advices, but generally, you know, first of all, I want to know why do you want to do street photography? 
what's your purpose which images do you like what you know, and, and do you want to do the same style can you do the same style there are people who like bruce gilden style photos but you know they would never dare to take these kind of images so for me it's really first of all i want to know how the person is because i think your images are a representation of yourself like valerie she also photographs street photography with right. a lot of empathy and we are very similar in that and so you know it's it really street photography has to match your style there are people who like to approach people to do street portraits see i don't like it we talked earlier do do i want or do people see me take their image i try not to not because i want to be sneaky just because I don't want to lose the moment. Once people realize you, they act differently. And I want natural images and stories in my images. So really find out what you want to do and then just practice, practice, practice. Yeah, and, and with photography, photography, let's be honest, practice is key. Um, with, with the type of photography I do, you have to know your camera and you have to understand exposure because you don't have time to think about any of that as you're shooting. So understanding the, the, the gear, and understanding the craft frees you to make your art, really. Uh, I can't say enough how much I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that I finally got you on here. If people wanna find you, and throughout the show, I've been putting up uh, as a lower third, uh, your you know social media accounts, et cetera, but just so that they, they hear it, if they're on the audio podcast. Um, your personal website is what? MarcoLaRousse.com. That's M-A-R-C-O-L-A-R-O-U-S-S-E.com. That's where you can find my work and, and street and uh, street photography workshops. By the way, Hamburg, I'm offering right now. There will be other places in the world too, mostly Europe right now, but I will Oh, offer that'd be fantastic. You should do one in Paris. <laughs> well, yeah, Valerie's awesome. already there, but Paris is big enough. Yeah. And, and let <laughs> me just clarify for everybody. There's two S's in LaRousse. So yes. L-A-R-O-U-S-S-E, MarcoLaRousse.com. Uh, and then your podcast people can find at what URL? Well, ppn.fm is probably the easiest the easiest URL to PPN. go to. ppn.fm. Or, or just enter ppn into your podcatcher and you should find it. Okay, and then also, isn't it photopodcast.com too? Yeah, photopodcast.com, photopodcasts.com, because we figured we pick a domain that describes what we're doing. We are more than one photo podcast. Because right. we're four shows a month, but really ppn.fm. We're, we're known as ppn now. So ppn.fm, like you, behind the show.tv is, is just what we went It's just easier. Them. Yeah, just yes. finding one that's short. Marco, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it, it is absolutely my pleasure. And to everybody watching, make sure that you head to the website. It's behindtheshot.tv. And on the website, you will be able to find a small gallery of more of Marco's work, links to all the websites, link to all of his, uh, links to all of his social media accounts, and some information about Marco as well. Uh, make sure that you, if you would, don't just watch it on YouTube, although that works too, but get your podcatcher app, search for Behind the Shot, make sure you find the one with my name in it, not the old network one. Uh, there's two of them. There's an audio and a video. Subscribe to it. That way you get each and every, my voice is totally gone now. Uh, that way you get each and every show delivered right to your podcast app. It makes it a little bit easier for you. Also, if you'd leave us a review in iTunes, it really does help with discoverability. And please share with your friends. Love for everybody to find the podcast. I'm Steve Brazel. Thanks again for joining me. We'll see you on the next show. Thank you.